Uh, I, after the wonderful papers that I saw uh, this morning here, I feel that I should warn you because I will have no pretty pictures. So I will, be, I will be focusing almost exclusively not on the permanent exhibits, but rather on the discourse that they generated. So many, many quotes from me. Here we go. Uh, after the revolution of 1989, art history was perceived as a field with social responsibility, and its representatives were expected to comment on contemporary social events. Their writing and exhibitions were subject to the similar demands as the work of general, political, or economic historians. To explain, and to a large extent legitimize, the current situation by analyzing its genesis. The causes of the demand lie in the general need for what was then called the rectification of history. Permanent exhibits had a specific role within this rectification, which was, which was largely based on their duration and allowed them to fulfill distinct function in the discourse of art history and in public debate. The advantage of the permanent exhibitions is that they typically present much longer and much more complete story of art. As the result of the long-term research, they naturally generate debates among art historians. But at the same time, because permanent exhibits are visited by school groups, as well as the general public, they are more often used as a means of education than the short-term exhibitions. And since the uh, implications of what is omitted, what is shown, and by whom, inspire the questions about power, national identity, and the marginalization or emancipation of minorities, permanent exhibits also provoke critics, polit political commentators, and the audience to comment. Thus, by their longer duration and more authoritative tone, the permanent exhibitions fulfill different functions in different discourses simultaneously. In this sense, long-term exhibitions are a much more influential and much more successful means of representing the past than the most detailed scholarly text. It is also why they have enjoyed even more intense public interest than the temporary exhibitions, as the media of the 1990s show. And in here, I am, uh, I'm actually working with the notion that Lucy Steeds presented, and I'm trying to benefit the multilingual uh, reader. So blue in English, black in Czech. So I quote, ah, the exhibition you are about to see with us is perhaps the most important cultural event in the history of Moravian Gallery in Brno. In the 24 halls of the Prajak Palace, thanks to the rich collection, a perfectly complete picture of the development of Czech art in the 20th century, from Art Nouveau to the present day, has been created. Public high expectations were shared by others. For art historians, the permanent exhibits were an opportunity to complete, or better yet, to rewrite the story of Czech art after 1948. For many, that task was more akin to moral responsibility than rather than a prestigious project, as Vera Jerausová put it. Fortunately, Fortunately, our situation is now expressed by the unprejudiced expectation that the exhibition spaces of the newly opened Trade Fair Palace will present the collection of modern art of the National Gallery. The first thing that will be shown is the totality of our art, its ability to express and reflect the world, and its special gift of communicating through images. Five years before the end of the epoch, which is also called the century of modern art, the scar of barbarism, which had established itself here in the middle of Europe and brought disrespect for creative free individuality as a contagion, is being healed. Art professionals were not alone in this belief. By the end of 1995, even the political pragmatists were expressing their conviction that the opening of the display of the 20th century art in the Trade Fair Palace was a repayment of a historical debt. So in here you can see a prime minister of the time giving exactly the sentiment. Uh, however, given the time-consuming nature of preparing permanent exhibitions, not only from a research point of view, but also from a curatorial and production perspective, the first one featuring post-war art did not open until 1994 in Brno and 1995 in Prague and Olomouc. Undoubtedly, they met with a lively interest of the public that in the early 1990s could visit a number of exhibitions exploring the post-war Czech art. However, the flaws of this feverish exhibition activity soon became apparent, and our historians stressed the need for a more systematic and critical approach. I quote, it seems that uncoordinated exhibition activity already brings rather irreparable losses than a certain profit. The era of cultural and political activity, which was manifested in the programs of state galleries, mainly by a chain of various traveling exhibitions made up of important works of art, should be irretrievably over." End quote. 
For this reason, too, permanent exhibits uh, were eagerly awaited as a definitive authorit authoritative account of an unknown past. At the same time, the Moravian Gallery, the National Gallery, and the Olomouc Museum of Art made them available in a situation when public awareness of post-war Czech art was not marginal anymore due to a number of exhibitions and publications that were already underway, and with this came much more pronounced public expectations. That is the main reason why, despite the initial public eagerness, it cannot be argued that the new permanent exhibits were an overly effective means of constructing a new shared identity. The strong public impact of permanent exhibits was hampered by the clashes between the concepts of our history and, uh, the, and the public expectations with which people came to the galleries. The incompatibility of personal experiences and personal beliefs and the scientific tools of our history meant that the public was mostly willing and able to accept only a part of the, of the narrative presented. So what were the reactions of the audience and how they can be related to post-revolutionary Czech identity? The most striking example is the conflict of the conflict uh, is the reaction to the permanent exhibits in the Trade Fair Palace opened at the very end of 1995. As Pavlina Morganova reminds us in her analysis of the political engagement of Czech art after the revolution, the first half of the 1990s was defined, among other things, by a strong resentment against state socialism. One aspect of the situation was an intense interest in powerful individual stories. In contrast to the collectivism of the previous regime, in the 1990s, the social interest was focused on the heroes, which in the context of our history were the artists. In his lecture, What is an Author, from 1969, Michel Foucault described the discursive effect of the use of the concept of the author as the individualization of history. It was that, the judgment of artistic quality, based on the comparison between life and the work, uh, that the, the concept of author brought to the contemporary Czech art history. But even though the concept of individualization is a useful tool for the analysis of Czech discourses of the 1990s, it, can, it is worth noting that Michel Foucault was not a widely read author among the Czech art historians before 1990. The opening of the exhibitions in the Trade Fair Palace prompted quick, intense, and disappointed reaction by the wider cultural community. I quote, uh, the long-awaited opening of a Czech modern gallery was preceded by a thrill of curiosity on the part of probably all of us who like direct contact with the generations of painters and sculptors who build the morphology and concepts of Czech art. We are among those who still got to know many of them, could meet them, talk to them, follow their work authentically, or from exhibitions and catalogues and polemics." End quote. As, an, as numerous similar statements in contemporary debate suggest, the artist was perceived as a natural hero of the story of Czech post-war art, in line with a desire to individualize history. The outrage over the insufficient emphasis put on authorship was indeed strongest among the artists themselves. Uh, Viktor Pivovarov, for instance, stressed that the first, and I quote, the first and the most important principle, which is obvious at the first glance, is not to give anyone the opportunity to stand out. All the most important figures of Czech art, Kupka, Shima, Fila, Boštík, or Sopko, should be scattered wherever possible, mixed with the others, so they do not stand out, end quote. The concept of the exhibit in the Trade Fair Palace, based on art movement, movement, not individuals, was perceived by artists as illegitimate. It was also partly caused by the typical art historical practice of late socialism, which mostly due to the difficulty of constructing a political accepted, yet relevant context, usually relied heavily on the author's intention and ignored, or at the very best suppressed, other possibilities of interpreting the artwork. The situation was not also held by the television, television coverage at the time. Uh, the television coverage invited the public to the Trade Fair Palace by basically listing the artist. I quote, a significant part of the exhibition consists of Czech modern art from 1900 to 1960. The exhibition presents such artists as Preisler, Slavicek, Kupka, Fila, Zrzavi. On top of giving the impression that there was not a single woman among the most important artists of the first six decades of the 20th century, the news report also described the artist as the basic element of the project. Public expectations were thus not only shaped by the contemporary emphasis on individuality dominating the public debate at the time, they were even further supported by the language used by the media. 
The rejection of the permanent exhibits in the Trade Fair Palace was made even stronger by comparison. The first ever Czech permanent exhibit showing post-war art in Brno focused on individuality in several ways. Firstly, based on the works in the collections of the Moravian Gallery, the curators chose the unifying theme of the human figure uh, for their story of the 20th century art. Secondly, the biographical details of the featured artists, such as place of birth or the location of their shows, were also used to highlight the regional Moravian dimension of the exhibit. And thirdly, the institution's emphasis on individual experience behind the art was also, uh, was also consistently communicated on various platforms. It was done, for example, in the appearances of the curators in the media. And I quote, in any case, we wanted to recall, recall what was being human, uh, what, what being human, sorry, was like in the 20th century, where we were headed and what art was like, which in the 20th century is more closely linked to people and the times. And that time was not exactly ideal. It was a time of ideologies, it was a time of concentration camps, it was a time of evil, of speed. And artists who are always more sensitive react to it. And that's why modern art is a kind of adventure and a kind of jungle, rather than a kind of ideal of beauty as conservative viewers might be used to. It's an art that kindles the heart, end quote. Similar individualistic ethos is apparent also in the speech of Jaroslav Kacher, the director of the Moravian Gallery, given at the opening. I quote, one of the fundamental qualities of a long-term exhibited art ensemble is its ability to connect the present with the past through a unique bond of artistic quality. It reflects the endless struggle of the finite human being, the desire to leave behind lasting evidence of their ephemeral existence, end quote. The emphasis on the artist's intention is linked to another notable element of contemporary art uh, public debate, namely the emphasis on the authenticity of the art on display. The fundamental dimension of the understanding of authenticity, as it was also applied in the 1990s, was already established in the discourse of the alternative unofficial art scene in the 1980s, before the fall of state socialism. Authenticity, in their view, was based on individual, individuals' action, namely in how meaningful their actions were to themselves and to their circle. As Michal, Michal Pullman shows in his analysis, the concept of authenticity began to be discussed more in the period after 1987, when perestroika became part of the official party line in Czechoslovakia. But its importance for the paradigm shift did not end there. Uh, in 1989, authenticity became an almost unanimously accepted ideal of a new form of social order in the sense of a necessary condition for a functioning society. The concept of authenticity can be said to have functioned analogically in the context of our history. Neither in the 1980s nor in the 1990s was authenticity associated with a particular artistic language or a movement. It was rather universally accepted as the basic measure of quality, the tool assuring that the art in question was worthy of inclusion in the newly formed canon. Uh, in the newly opened permanent exhibits, Authenticity was often attested to both by the incorporation into the tradition of modern art, modern Western art, and by comparison with Western art production from the same period. The continuity with the tradition of modern art was seen by many, including the artists of the new canon themselves, as a way of achieving an authentic expression of their work. This understanding was reinforced by the situation of the 1990s, where, when works of the new canon were not on permanent display, at least not for a long time, and, top of, on, and on, on top of that, they were only partially historicized in academic writing. The fact that individual artists were able to work with forms and codes that were independent of socialist realism and in turn showed similarities to Western art was seen by the artists and our historians and even the public as an affirmation of the authenticity of these works, which stem from their disregard for the official discourse and its claims. As we can show in one of my favorite quotes, uh, it was not until the 1957 that he, Vladimir Bodnik, the artist in question, met the painter Jan Kotik, who was familiar with the development of world art, of world art or Western art, and who demonstrated to Bodnik in his books how close to his work was the, was the current world tendencies, end quote. 
At this point, the 1990s conviction about the interrupted Czech history reappears. The emphasis on the domestic tradition of modern art uh, has allowed historians to completely disregard the decades of state socialism and build a story of modern art that begins at the end of the 19th century and continues uninterrupted despite the, uh, the historical aberration of the Communist Party dictatorship. So if we ask how the newly opened permanent exhibition of post-war Czech art in the 1990s contributed to the formation of Czech post-revolutionary identity, the answer must be in a specific way, if, if any. Uh, the expectations of the, uh, on the part of the public regarding the appropriate form of grasping the socialist past were so strong that they sometimes prevented the reception of the message that the curators intended to communicate. An examination of the permanent exhibits and the public reaction to them shows that the existing prison of pre-understanding was so strong in the 1990s that only those interpretations of post-war art history that corresponded with them were accepted by the public. Namely, firstly, the belonging of the Czech culture, culture to the Western world, uh, which was evidenced by the comparison with West, Western artistic production and, conversely, by the absence of comparison with the art from the Eastern Bloc. Secondly, the confirmation of correctness of individualism as the natural measure of ethical behavior and artistic creation. In particular, the emphasis on the concept of the author and authenticity through which the individualization of history was achieved was grounded in the legitimacy of the ideals of the Velvet Revolution. These features, which resonated in the public sphere, were entirely consistent with a neoliberal discourse that completely dominated the Czech public space and media after 1989, and were not challenged at least until the 1996 election, which was the first time when the left-wing party won a significant percentage of the vote. So, uh, Pavlina, you actually scared me into submission with your mention that you will be, you'll be watching the time, so I'm, I'm actually done ahead of the time. So, thank you. <laughs>